And here we go. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Good. Welcome to episode number four. Ooh, that sounds about right. Yeah. Let's call it four um, of Explore Your Faith Live. So what we do every week is we kind of model the explore your faith meetup that we do every tuesday and thursday night and wednesdays coming soon mm -hmm. but after this yeah. and not the same topics as this right. oh yeah. we don't get to cheat no oh. <laughs> no unless you know someone in the tuesday group then, <laughs> okay. then yeah. you can pay them off pay them right. off to get that discussion guy actually you can just go to the website on mondays and oh, yeah, that's <laughs> or open the newsletter and click on the discussion guide for the week so, be prepared <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> it's it's not a secret there's there's no secrets here so anyway uh we do a really condensed version of what we do at our explore your faith uh, meetups and of course those are not televised those are very secret very co confidential so you can feel comfortable um, expressing your thoughts and beliefs in a non-judgmental space. But the three of us are here to get judged. So let's do it. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> yeah, if you're watching and have a question for us and we happen to catch it in the comments, um, go ahead and, and put it there. No guarantee we'll answer it, but um, you know, you can always feel free to, to put them there. So here we go. Um, our icebreaker question uh, for tonight is, what is the worst tourist attraction you've ever been to? And um, I'll start. I, you know what? I, I, I don't think I'll be as specific as I would be in a meetup because you know, maybe maybe someone's watching that you know owns the place or something. But mm -hmm. there, it's a it's like an old you know one of those like kitschy old west towns, mm -hmm. and clearly it was probably cool like at one point, but now. It's just, it's not that cool. They've added so, like these big like bungee rides and stuff like that, but you have to pay like an extra 50 bucks if you want to go on those, <laughs> which is a problem in itself. But anyway, I went to this thing for a niece's birthday party and it was 120 degrees that day. And at least at the end of that, I was told I was getting a steak dinner and most of the stuff was closed because it's the middle of the summer, but they keep the restaurant open and a couple of the little shops. And we had to kill like an hour in this little dusty theme town. Um, and finally we get to go into the restaurant for dinner and go in and it's stifling hot in there. Mm. And I'm like, what is going on? Terrible. And someone's like, oh yeah, they don't, they don't have air conditioning. And I'm like, they don't have air conditioning. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm already sweating through my shirt and we sit down for dinner and uh, the server comes over to take our, our orders and, Say, well, I'll start with the water. And she said, okay, well, we only have bottled water because it's like the well water is not good enough to drink here. Mm. And you have to pay for every bottle of water you want. <laughs> I'm like, wait, it's 120 degrees uh -huh. and I have to pay for every bottle of water I'm going to drink. And I'm going to drink like 10 of these. Yeah. So, <laughs> so anyway, it was just, it was not great. Kind of terrible. Kind of terrible, kind of really terrible. But the little niece in her little cowgirl outfit had a great time. Right? yeah See, that, that's what you do it for man you do it for the kids it is yeah. it is so that's the lesson always yeah. do it for the kids yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the age appropriateness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah what about you guys worst tourist attraction so uh, so i'll give you one so maybe not it's made to the point of it may not be the worst for everyone but okay. in al in florida they have um like alligator lands and okay. places where you go in and there's this one near where my family lives where it's like they have this like enormous their gift shop is in a giant alligator and so like nice. you walk in the mouth and go in but then okay. it's just all these like bins of different size alligators like climbing all over each other nice and it's really creepy Ooh. and i don't mind the parts where it's like they're kind of you're on platforms and they're like kind of it looks like they're in the wild but like the the like small six by six bins of like hundreds of alligators climbing all over each other. 
um, it gives me nightmares. So yeah, that's that's okay. nightmare fuel right there. Yeah, that's yeah. I'm gonna have a nightmare tonight. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Payne. Okay. Uh, the worst tourist attraction I've been to is something called the Mystery Castle. <laughs> and it's in South Phoenix. And um, it says, uh, it, it, back in the 30s, you know, kind of, you know, I probably, yeah, probably 20s, 30s. Some guy moved out here from the East Coast, left his family, his little, uh, his wife and daughter and said, I'm going to go build you a castle in the desert. And this guy never wrote back and never, uh, never sent for him, whatever. But he basically <laughs> he came out to Arizona and uh, put like a gambling den and house and bar together with like railroad ties and uh, just junk. It's a, it's a big house made out of junk. And um <laughs> It, it is really, really crazy looking. Um, but what's what's sad is that you get to the end and it's owned by the daughter or somebody, you know, somebody from the family. And yeah. she, the whole time, you know, she's telling you, oh, yeah, you know, he just wanted to, uh, you know, my grandfather just wanted to build me a castle in the desert, you know, but, you know, never sent for you or. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah yeah so it's, it's really it's depressing it's, it's very bizarre and then the story and the people that work there are even more bizarre <laughs> would you would you say it's a mystery yeah, i would say it's definitely yeah. a mystery yeah, yeah. <laughs> very nice all right let, let's jump into our first topic um so there's an, an article that said recently scientists found bacteria buried underneath the ocean floor that is more than a hundred million years old and it was still alive. So that's that's pretty mind blowing in itself. But let's do a little thought experiment here. What would you change if you could live not a hundred million years, but just a million years? Um, how would your life uh, be different or how would you think about your life differently? I would want to be an astronaut. Because like, I, so we went to Meteor Crater, uh, I think mm -hmm. it's Meteor Crater, um, a couple years ago. Sure. And there's a, um, there's some sign in there that says, don't worry, there's no big asteroids going to hit the world in the next like, foreseeable future. It was beyond my life expectancy. Mm -hmm. But a million years, there's probably going to be one. So I would be um, significantly investing in space travel and um, yeah and 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 how we do that um but i also wonder like how do you save for retirement if you're gonna be like <laughs> yeah million? and like do, do people actually become like more greedy because they Ooh. have so much longer to go or yeah. do you go the other way and you become more altruistic because you're like thinking of longer but um i don't know i feel like com compounding interest would would be to your advantage there yeah, maybe but then yeah. you got inflation too and what's 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 that that's true this candy bar costs two trillion dollars <laughs> <laughs> would you like that in pennies <laughs> yeah here let me let me swipe my brain chip to pay for that <laughs> i don't know i assume i assume if we're around that long we'll, we'll have something better than a barcode on our head but anyway <laughs> um what about like uh as, as far as thinking of like justice issues or the environment and stuff like that, how do you, do you think, you think we would believe differently and behave differently um, if we knew, if we knew we had to, you know, sustain ourselves personally. So, you know, the human race may go on for a million years, who knows. Um, but, you know, we usually don't think about it as I'm not thinking about my great, 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 great grandchildren. I'm thinking about, driving across town in a giant SUV right now. So, <laughs> but if it, but if we knew it was going to be our planet still, we were still going to be on it in a million years. I would think we'd think about that differently. Right. Yeah. I think kind of with the space travel ideas that, you know, you would be thinking about what, you know, cataclysmic events can you, um, a not avoid, but also too, what can, what can you avoid? Um, and so I think that that would definitely play into to the picture, especially over a million years. Yeah, I, I think we'd hopefully 
try to get along with each other better. Yeah. Um, you know, especially because you'd have more time to get to know more people. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe sometimes we treat each other worse because it's like, okay, I have this limited amount of time here. And as I get older, I kind of got to just stick with the, the people I really trust and, and really love. Um, and I got to keep that circle tight. But if it's a million years, we could draw that circle pretty well. And I wonder what the difference to you between like a million years or like 200 years. Yes. Like yeah. something that mm -hmm. maybe the meteor, the meteor crater told us we'd be good for 200 years, mm -hmm. but you've got the whole environmental impact and stuff that's maybe a little more urgent and how that might weigh in as well. Something that's still a little more, the yeah. problem, the problems are different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that's actually, I think the better thought experiment is you know, what if you could live 200 or 250 years, something where you could have at least two lifetimes in it, mm -hmm. you know, um, that I think gets your brain spinning a little more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, anyway, that's a good one, guys. Um, and uh, here's, here's two, here's two million years um, <laughs> of life. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I think I would just stop celebrating birthdays after after a while. <laughs> Be like, whatever. This is seven hundred eighty-five thousand two hundred eighty-nine birthday. Uh -huh. um, don't bother with the candles. No. Um, speaking of getting old, um, research from the United States shows that religious attachment commonly falls through young and middle adulthood, but then increases through one's forties and beyond. The theologian James Fowler explained in this pattern in his famous 1981 book, Stages of Faith. After studying hundreds of human subjects, Fowler observed that as young adults, many people are put off by ideas that seem arbitrary or morally retrograde, such as those surrounding sexuality. They may also seem disillusioned by rel religion's inability to explain life's hardest puzzles. For example, the idea of a loving God in the face of a world full of suffering. And that's from an article called How to Navigate a Midlife Change of Faith in the, in the Atlantic. Mm. So do you find that as you get older, uh, your questions about uh, faith, religion, spirituality uh, get, get more difficult, get the answers may, may be less satisfying? Um, what do you guys think? Do you agree or, or disagree with the premise? Yeah, I think, I think that, you know, I think a lot, a lot of the article sort of suggests that there's a first first half of life and then there's a second half of life. Mm -hmm. And I know that during my first half of life that I definitely uh, held on to the black and white answers uh, when it came, came to faith and really when it came to any, anything, but, yeah. you know, faith. Um, and then, you know, as, as I transitioned into the second half of life, um, I recognized that almost everything was in a gray area and I had to wrestle with being okay with, with it being uh, that this, most things are a paradox. They're just mm -hmm. not, you're just not going to solve it. And um, wrestling with those ideas are, are, are almost like the point of your journey. Yeah. What about you, Amy? Um, I guess I've been intrigued by trying to answer the hard questions that I think like, why do bad things happen? Yeah. Or where is God when bad things happen? Are those things that I have, I did not find those answers or even people asking those questions um, earlier. And I have kind of gone on the journey. No, I didn't even know what questions I was asking. I was just like, something's missing and trying to figure out what questions to ask and then trying to get into, I say answers, but there's, um, it's, almost, it's to the point of the gray area, being more comfortable that there is wonder and there is uncertainty and we have to be vulnerable and just be, being able to be confident in myself enough to not need all that certainty around me. And mm -hmm. I think that that has taken time to, 
to be able to, to, to get, the, I say, get there, not there yet, but on that journey to kind of let go of some of that certainty. And, yeah. um, and that takes, that takes time and experience to, to do. Yeah. And I think there's a difference too, of like, that's not, you're not giving up on trying to ask those questions. It's just this, this evolution of, of, like you said, that, that recognition of, oh, maybe I'm, maybe I don't need answers, black and white answers for this. Maybe it is about the journey. Maybe it is about um, the experience. Yeah. I also think too, for, for people, you, when, when those questions come up and if you're a person who needs to hear a response, when you say, okay, why is there, why do good thing? wait, why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah. Um, and the person you ask that question, it's a pastor, it's a religious leader, uh, your next door neighbor, your brother, I don't know. Um, and you know, you, you need an answer that's like, oh, I don't know, let's, let's explore that together. Let's figure that out. Let's, let's ask more questions. Mm -hmm. um, and if that person responds in that way, then I think you're, you're good to go on, on the religion and spirituality thing. Like, I think you'll keep going down that, that conscious journey. But if, if it's a, well, here's the answer because God says so. <laughs> and you're like, oh, this is what religion is about. I have this big complicated question and your answer to me is, well, it just is. So, and there's one answer and one response to it. I think that would, that would shut me off. Um, and, and vice versa, if you need a black and white answer and you know, you come to, to Rob Reinders and I'm going to say, yeah, let's go on this cool journey together. And they're going to be like, no, just tell me the stupid answer. Like mm -hmm. point, point to a page in the Bible, <laughs> give me the book <laughs> and solve this once and for all for me. And I'm good. Um, so I think that plays a big, a big part in, into it as well. Um, yeah. Um, what other, other thoughts um, do you guys have on that one? You know, there's this thing about, and it's, I want to say it's conventional, conventional wisdom, but there's, I think that there's another phrase that's escaping me right now, but mm -hmm. it's kind of the idea, like when you're little, somebody tells you to make your bed and so you, well, I never made my, I was never good at that, but like in theory, <laughs> you make your bed because someone tells so you to make surprised. your bed. I know, shocking. <laughs> and, um, and then as you get older, you're like, I'm not going to make my bed because somebody told me to, and you kind of like rebel against the rule. Mm -hmm. And then when you get older and beyond that, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to make, I'm going to think about what are the pros and cons of like making my bed and you like make a decision. So you understand the kind of convention of that is something that you do, but then going through the like kind of rebellion stage and then coming into that, it's like post-conventionalism or something to be able to say like, yeah. I am. Um, I am choosing not to make my bed because of X, Y, or Z, or I am doing it because it sets me up for success in the day and blah, blah, blah. But it's, um, and again, I think that that takes time. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see if I got another, another question here before we move on to our last topic. Um, I don't, so let's move on to our last topic. <laughs> <laughs> this one is, and, and this has been, this has been in the news. I've seen this in a lot of the feeds on the on the ticks, snap, chat, book, Twitter, what whatever the kids are into these days. Um, this is toxic positivity. Have you guys seen any of these articles? So while cultivating a positive mindset is a powerful coping mechanism, toxic positivity stems from the idea that the best or only way to cope with the bad situation is to put a positive spin on it and not dwell on the negative, um, says a clinical health psychologist. It results from our tendency to undervalue negative emotional experiences and overvalue positive ones. So are you guys uh, big on, on toxic positivity or not so big on it? I don't know if that's the question. <laughs> I guess, are you guilty of it? Are yeah. we guilty of, of uh, you know, kind of glossing over things or telling everyone it's going to be okay, even when we know, like, it's probably not going to be okay. <laughs> I, I would say as a parent, sometimes I, I err too much on the side of, well, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to be okay. And sometimes I think my kids just need to tell them it's going to be okay, but right. I'm not very good at that. 
Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think we have a nature of uh, you know as humans as something something called experiential avoidance, where Ooh. we do whatever we possibly can to avoid pain. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, however, uh, em- embracing that uh, pain all- often um, is a better solution than avoiding because avoiding that pain often uh, results in negative lifestyle choices to sort of either mask the pain or you're going to yeah. escape the pain. And uh, even, you know, even if you, you know, don't, uh, you, you just move into your head and continue to have the same conversation over and over and over and over again about the same pain, that's still, that's still not good. And so de- dealing with the pain and accepting the pain, I think is, um, uh, the way to go, <laughs> even though it's really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, Matthew, um, there's a theologian named Matthew Fox, and he talks about, he has like the, these four steps, and he talks about the way of positivity, but not necessarily toxic, but just like thinking, you know, life, life's good. Like it's there in recognizing the joy in life. And then he talks about like the way of like negative, which is, actually letting yourself experience the sadness and Mm -hmm. grief and pain. And, and once you fully kind of embrace both the highs and the lows, the joys, then you start moving into places where you can actually be creative and transform the world. And Mm. so essentially, like, if you are, if you do kind of give into that toxic positivity, where you don't let yourself feel the negative, or you avoid it or whatnot, um, it actually limits your ability to live life fully and also to create or do new things in the world too, um, which that's really kind of stuck with me over because I, I think I tend to generally be a positive person, but I would p- put it maybe more in terms of, I think I'm hopeful mm-hmm. as opposed Ooh. to um, toxically positive because I think hope also for me also has a realistic of understanding what are the challenges and what's what's um it it just the the things that get in the way and then it's not all like rainbows and sunshine all the time Mm -hmm. or or is um what keeps popping in my head when i talk about toxic positivity is that song from the lego movie Oh. Everything, Everything is awesome. Is awesome. <laughs> and then, did you see? Did you see Lego Movie Two? Uh, yes. Yeah. Everything's yeah. not awesome. awesome. Yeah. Uh-huh. And we I need like, both songs. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we completed the circle with the movies. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I think there's definitely something to be said about we get we have to find that balance and knowing like you know what so, some days i just need to be like you know what i'm gonna feel like crap today mm-hmm. so what's gonna happen like everything has gone wrong the first seven hours of this day and <laughs> i do not have the energy to make it better yeah. but when i wake up in the morning we're gonna try again <laughs> yeah. you know and if i find myself saying like nah it's been four days in a row and everything still kind of sucks then there's a problem yeah right and two on the like glossing things over with uh with positivity it just it's it's not helpful um so just trying to i think be realistic (laughs) i don't know i always joke i always joke about if you set the bar low <laughs> He's in the more low. You're more likely to win. <laughs> so, but it's, it's it sounds terrible. But I think sometimes we do like we set we set our expectations so high that by only having the best outcome will we be happy. Right. And um and we tell ourselves like we tell ourselves that lie. Um and instead of back mm-hmm. to our midlife faith questions of it's a journey. It's an experience, um, live in the moment, whatever the bumper sticker is, um, and find, find the meaning, find the positivity in that, but also understand the negativity and why is this happening? Why is this important? Get curious about it. 
I think Brene Brown talks about getting curious mm -hmm. um, about that kind of stuff. Um, and that's, that's where it gets interesting, I think. Was it last week or the week before we talked a little bit about resilience too? Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when your expectations end up being too high that everything's going to be great, it knocks you down um, and can impair your resilience when things don't go great. Um, and it's that expectation gap too that I think social media creates sometimes when you're yes. like comparing when you're comparing yourself to people who are only sharing the idealized version of their life on social media, mm -hmm. and you're like, "Well, my life's not like that." Well, their life isn't like that either. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. you have this. Um, so I, I think that there's something too that by, hmm, I think it's better for our relationships and for our mental health to share our positivity and negativity with each other yeah. um, as well. And not simply acknowledging in ourselves, but also being open about both the realness of how we experience life. Right. Yeah. Um, one, one quick, I started this with a, a social media joke, but in all seriousness, the other day I decided I wanted to learn about TikTok finally. Right. So yeah, I know. Um, and I felt, about it. <laughs> I felt, I felt really, really, really old. I felt like I, I was a million years old <laughs> when I, when I found it and I was scrolling through these videos and everyone was extremely good looking and young. Um, and very, very talented. They were either uh, some sort of singer or dancer or um, acrobat, like mm -hmm. a gymnast, I guess, um, or uh, what was what was the, or comedian. Like those mm -hmm. seemed to be be the genres. And and the videos were cut extremely well. And they were very, very creative. Like I see why. Like it's huge among twenty year olds. Um, I finally found some cooking ones, and I'm like, oh, recipes. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can do that. No, mm, pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> so now I follow three people on TikTok, and it's all cooking. <laughs> nice. Nice. But but I immediately like after five minutes of scrolling through those videos, I felt like shit. Mm -hmm. I just felt like like total crap. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, that and that's felt like toxic positivity, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, I had to go like make myself sad by watching a sad movie. A little while. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, wait. No, I made myself feel better by watching a sad movie. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're coming near the end of our time. Uh, any final takeaways, uh, my friends? I'm going to take Amy's um, talk about both the good and the bad, talk about it with other people. Yeah. yeah, I think that I think that's key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. don't don't keep that to yourself. Mm -hmm. I was thinking I'm I I'm just intrigued and want to go visit the mystery castle now. So <laughs> <laughs> social thread field trip might, to the I mystery might need castle. To go check out the mystery post -pandemic. castle. Post pandemic. <laughs> Experience for sure. <laughs> yeah. but, also, but also recognize I'm not going to live to be a million years old and life is short. So I need to make choices around how I spend my time because, um, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. That to me, that, that question, that, that very first question about a million years, always about how, how are you spending your time? And, you know, you, when you get to the end of the day, the week or the end of your life and you look back and you say, okay, this is how I spent my time and I'm glad I spent it this way. Mm, yeah. So, yeah. I think having, having those, you know, three or four things that every single day, that's what, that's what you're doing. And because I'm not going to regret doing those four things. So. Awesome. You just inspired me to delete my, my mind dump game off my phone that I'm spending way too much time on every day. <laughs> so I think I'm going to delete. What's funny is I, I one, of the, one of the most dumpiest mind game is that is Microsoft solitaire. Have you played that? Not lately. Oh, that yeah. So addicting on the phone. I, nice. I've been using it three times. Wait, uh, is your phone Windows ninety eight? <laughs> <laughs> Do you carry around like an old CRT monitor PC with you? I was trying to find Minesweeper the other day, and I was like, well, how, yes. "How can I play Minesweeper?" And it's really hard on the phone. Like my finger is too big for Minesweeper on the phone because the square is really. Big. I never understood that game. I'm like, "Why, why are there bombs here?" <laughs> right. right, bombs are bad. Yeah. We shouldn't have those in computers. 
Wow. Well, if uh, <laughs> if you want to have uh, conversations like this, and <laughs> probably more meaningful and rich conversation with with other humans, um, then you can join us uh, Tuesday, Thursdays, and coming Wednesday nights uh, for the closed uh, groups, the non Facebook Live uh, groups. Head over to socialthread.org slash meetups. You can find the Zoom links there to register and uh, the discussion guides uh, to download. And uh, Robert's going to tell you about some other ways you can support Social Thread and what we're doing so we can keep showing up here on Facebook Live every Wednesday night for one person to watch <laughs> live. It's better than zero. That's it is. Doing. It is. Well, hey, yeah. one person, if you're watching this or if you're watching this on a, on a replay uh, and you want to get involved, you can go to socialthread.org. Um, and just click get involved and and we'll send you an invite to one of these cool meetups and uh, if, if you're looking to say hey this this may not be for me but I want to be involved still you can of course support social thread as a nonprofit. so you can go to uh, socialthread.org forward slash support and make a tax deductible donation there all right well hey um I, because we did this today, I feel like I lived a life full of meaning and I'm glad I got to hang out with you guys. So, um, we'll see you next week. All right. All Goodbye. right. Hey, have a great Labor Day weekend. Okay. Yeah. You too. Yeah. Bye. See y'all. Bye. Um, oh no. What do I do?